So back in the day when I was a kid, this was one of the most coveted toys. This is what you call a magic eight ball. Life is full of questions. And the magic eight ball knows the answers. All you have to do is ask a question, then turn it over, and the answer will magically appear. So, let's try it out, all right? Since this is Super Bowl Sunday, <laughs> let's start with a sports question. So, Magic 8 Ball, will the Colts ever be good again? <laughs> the answer is, it is decidedly so. All right, good news on this Sunday morning. Let's try another question here. Who here is single but longs for true love? Raise your hand. Okay. All right. Remind me of your first name. Elizabeth. All right, Elizabeth, it's a good thing you came to church today. <laughs> because you are about to get the answer to the most pressing question one could ask. Magic eight ball, will Elizabeth ever find true love? The answer is, oh, it's saying don't count on it. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't have come to church this morning. I'm just... <laughs> All right, one more so that you know what to expect in the remainder of this sermon. Magic eight ball, will I tell any really good jokes today? Let the magic eight ball speak. All right. Will I tell any good jokes today? And the magic eight ball says, as I see it, yes. It's a very good answer. As I see it, yes. <laughs> yes, they still make those, Ron, if you want to run home and get one. <laughs> there is a reason why the Magic 8 Ball was such a hit. Life bristles with uncertainty. All kinds of questions. Critical choices that we have to make. And we find ourselves longing for help in getting those decisions right. Should I change jobs or not? Are we compatible? Should we get married? Should I divorce? Should I get the surgery or wait? What should I do with my finances? Is it time to buy a new car or should I wait? Should I reconcile with my sister or not? And if so, how? And on and on it goes. When a person of faith needs to make critical choices, how do they do that? What do they do? That's what today's scripture passage is about as we come to the second installment in our study of the Old Testament book of Daniel. Let's start with a prayer. God, our faith is not just window dressing. Our faith is not just about the next life and where we go when we die. Our faith is also about the here and now, about today and tomorrow, and how to navigate through life. You are the way, the truth, and the life. Please, show us the way. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Sometimes when we're reading the Bible, we come to a passage of Scripture that, that leaves us cold, that doesn't resonate with us, that feels far away and distant. And when we encounter a passage like that, 
the temptation is to quickly set it aside, to move on to something else, another passage that does feel more accessible, more immediately relevant to us. And that's how I felt when I began to study today's scripture passage, Daniel chapter 2, because as you heard just a few moments ago, it's a story about how an old king had a dream. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and in his dream, he saw this huge statue in front of him. The head of the statue was made of gold, the chest and the arms made of silver, the abdomen and the thighs were made of bronze, and the legs and feet, the lower legs and feet, were made of a combination of iron mixed with clay. It turns out that this was foreshadowing the rise and fall of four ancient kingdoms. The head of gold represented Babylon, over which Nebuchadnezzar presided. But ultimately, Babylon gave way to the chest and arms of silver, representing the Median Empire, which then gave way to the bronze of the abdomen and the thighs, representing the Persian Empire. And then ultimately along came Alexander the Great and the Grecian Empire, the lower legs of iron, which after Alexander's death split in two, so the clay gets mixed with the iron, weakening it. And then in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, this huge boulder strikes the feet of the statue and everything comes tumbling down. So that what we have in this passage is a dream predicting the rise and fall of four ancient empires. And we read through that and we oh, yawn. Who cares? about the rise and fall of four ancient empires. That's yesterday's news. How is a passage of scripture like this relevant to us in our life today? That's how I felt when I first began studying this passage and I found myself thinking maybe we should skip chapter two and just move on to chapter three. But then it occurred to me that when we encounter a passage of scripture like this, before being too quick to set it aside, we need to step back and say, wait a minute. Is there something here for us? We need to sit with these passages, let them breathe, let them speak, and ask, God, is there something you want to say to us today through this scripture? Because Hebrews 4.12 tells us the word of God is living and active. In other words, the words of scripture are not static on the page. They're not dead letters carved into stone. God lives in the words, breathes through them, speaks through them to us so that if we pause long enough to say, God, what do you want to say to us through this passage? And if we sit with it and we let the passage breathe, all of a sudden, messages from God, real-time interactive messages start to come to us. So this week when I asked that question, as I sat with this passage, all of a sudden, like an old Polaroid picture fresh out of the camera, chapter 2 began to come into focus. This is what I think God wants to say to us through Daniel chapter 2. Last week, we got started with this sermon series, and we saw that Daniel and three of his close companions, each sons of royal families in Israel, when Nebuchadnezzar invaded and conquered Jerusalem, he carried these sons of royal families back to Babylon and inducted them into a three-year re-education program meant to equip them to become wise counselors and advisors in the court, the administration of King Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel completed this program and was now among the wise men of Babylon who were part of Nebuchadnezzar's administration. Sometime after that is when Nebuchadnezzar had this dream that we just talked about, and the dream troubled him greatly. So as you heard Amy read a few moments ago, Daniel chapter 2, beginning at verse 10, the king brings in some of the greatest of his enchanters, some of the wisest of his sorcerers, some of the greatest of the Chaldean wise men, and the king says to them, I've had this dream and I want to know what it means, and the Chaldeans wise men say to him, well, just tell us what your dream was and we'll tell you what it means, and the king says, no, no, not so fast. You tell me what I dreamed and then I'll know that you have the power to tell me its interpretation. 
the Chaldeans say to the king, there's no one on earth who can reveal what the king demands. In fact, no king, however great or powerful, has ever asked such a thing of any magician, enchanter, or Chaldean. Just tell us the dream. We'll tell you the interpretation. No, Nebuchadnezzar said, you tell me what I dreamed, then I'll know you have the power. And back and forth they go. Nebuchadnezzar was not used to being told no. And so, verse 12, because of this, the king flew into a violent rage and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. Not long after that, a soldier, a Babylonian soldier, shows up knocking on Daniel's door. He's there to carry off Daniel and his three closest friends, Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah, to their execution along with all of the other Babylonian wise men. Daniel asks the soldier what's going on. The soldier tells him what has been happening. So now Daniel finds himself in a dilemma. He and his three closest friends are facing imminent death. The king is demanding to know what he dreamed, but nobody can tell the king what he dreamed. Daniel is facing his imminent death. It's a classic example of being caught in an impossible situation where forces far more powerful than us are sweeping us along and we find ourselves feeling utterly helpless, which is something that happens to every single one of us and will happen to every single one of us in life, which is why Daniel chapter 2 is so profoundly relevant even in our lives today thousands of years later. When life takes you by the collar, grabs you, and puts you where you do not want to be, when you are facing an impossible situation and forces more powerful than you are sweeping you to a dark and destructive place, when you find yourself apparently doomed, trapped between a rock and a hard place, what will you do? How will you respond when your boss is being impossible. When your marriage is falling apart, when your child is on a dangerous path, when your health is failing, when your finances are a disaster, when the proverbial Babylonian soldier comes knocking at your door, ready to carry you off to a place that you do not want to go, what will you do? Wes Brandon Hoff in his blog describes a famous speech that Admiral William McRaven gave back in 2014 to a group of graduating college students. In his speech, McRaven told stories of his training as a Navy SEAL. In particular, he focused on the ninth week of that training, which is commonly known as Hell Week where the, trainee, the Navy SEAL trainees are put through an incredible series of ordeals that put them under enormous mental and physical stress, culminating on day six in McRaven and his fellow trainees being told to paddle down the mud river all the way. <laughs> Sorry, someone's calling and the person has left the room, so... There we go. Thank you, Bambi. So on the sixth day of this week of intensive training, the trainees were told to paddle down the river south of San Diego to the mud flats that are found there. For the next 15 hours, Raven says, he and his fellow trainees would be immersed in the cold, freezing mud, howling winds around them as their instructors shouted at them stressfully trying to get them to give up. In his speech, McRaven described the experience in these words, quote, as the sun began to set that Wednesday evening, my training class was ordered into the mud. The mud consumed each of us 
till there was nothing visible but our heads. The instructors told us we could leave the mud only if five of us would quit. If just five of us would give up, we could get out of the oppressive cold. Looking around that mud flat, it was apparent that some were about to give up. It was still over eight hours till the sun would come up. Eight more hours of bone-chilling cold. The chattering teeth and shivering moans of the trainees were so loud, it was hard to hear anything. And then, one voice began to echo through the night. One voice raised in song. The song was terribly out of tune, but sung with great gusto. One voice then became two. Two became three. And before long, everyone in the class was singing in the mud. We knew that if one person could rise above the misery, the others could as well. The instructors threatened us with more time in the mud if we kept up the singing. But the singing persisted. And somehow, the mud <laughs> seemed a little warmer, the wind a little tamer, and the dawn not so far away. Imagine yourself in that situation. Everything's closing in around you, and you are about to go under. What will you do? McRaven and his fellow trainees made it through because they chose to sing. Defiant hope. They defiantly refused to yield to despair. There's an old parable about a time when the devil was holding a yard sale. All of the devil's usual tools were laid out on tables, each one marked with a different price. There was jealousy, there was hatred, there was greed, there was selfishness. All of the common tools of the devil laid each with a different price. Off to the side, in a special display case, there was one more tool labeled discouragement. And the price marked on discouragement was much higher than the other tools. So someone asked the devil, why is this tool, discouragement, priced so much higher than all the others? The devil said, ah, that's my favorite tool. When I've tried everything else to break a person and nothing has worked, I always reach for discouragement. It always works because so few people know that discouragement belongs to me. James Kennedy once said, what really matters is what happens in us, not to us. Let that settle in. What, when those Navy SEALs were in the mud, what, was, what really mattered was not what was happening to them, but what was happening in them. Johann Goethe once said, the one who has never despaired has never lived. In other words, despair is an ordinary part of life. But Cornel West goes on to say, it's okay to despair, but don't give despair the last word. That is exactly what Daniel refused to do in today's Bible story. Daniel refused to give up. This is the first key practical lesson we can draw from this passage of Scripture. In times of despair, first and foremost, never give up hope. When all of the other Babylonian wise men were ready to resign themselves to their fate, when they found themselves saying, look, the king is asking of us that which is impossible. Nobody can know what's in the king's head. We are doomed we may as well accept our fate and go to our execution. When everybody else around him was ready to give up hope, Daniel said not so fast because Daniel knew he had access to a resource that was a potential game changer. When everybody else was ready to give up, Daniel had hope because he believed, Daniel 2.28, there is a God in heaven 
who reveals mysteries. Daniel still had hope because he knew, Daniel 2.22, God reveals deep and hidden things. God knows what is in the darkness. So, when the soldier shows up at Daniel's door, we're told, Daniel 2.16, Daniel sent a message to the king requesting that the king give him some time and he, Daniel, would tell the king the interpretation. So Daniel reached out to his friends, went back to his home, informed his companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. So that Daniel and his companions and the rest of the wise men of Babylon might not perish. And then, we don't know how much time passed, but then we're told the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision in the night. You see, the key here is that Daniel prayed. But it's not just that he prayed. It's how he prayed. It's how he and his three companions prayed. When we pray, especially in times of distress, we have a, a natural, reflexive tendency to pray a certain way. We reflexively tend to pray what I would call escapist prayers. For example, this past Monday, I had a, a dentist appointment. Over the past three months, I've had three different dentist appointments as I've been catching up with some deferred maintenance on my teeth. Each time, these last three months, I've been in the dentist. It was to get a filling in a tooth or two. So I've now become very familiar with the, pro the current state-of-the-art process of tooth fillings. I know exactly what's going to happen in the process. I hate it. Not because it's painful. I go to the, the gentle dentist, and honestly, I've felt no significant pain in any of these procedures. But here's what I hate about getting a filling. They lay you back, of course. Your head's way back. Your mouth is full of all kinds of things and the, the dentist's fingers and instruments. And inevitably, as the dentist is preparing for the filling, there comes that point where she says, okay, I'm going to blow some cool air on the tooth now to dry it. And once I do that, she says, do not swallow until the procedure is over. It needs to be completely dry or we'll have to begin all over again. So you're laid back there. She's working away on your tooth and you cannot swallow. And you keep saying to yourself, I cannot swallow. I cannot swallow. I will not swallow, which doesn't help. Nevertheless, saliva begins to gather inevitably at the back of your mouth. And there's this powerful reflexive response that just wants to swallow, right? But I can't. And before long, I can't breathe very well. Am I imagining it? Or it's, it's almost like the dentist's gentle version of waterboarding. You know, it's like, it's like <laughs> what's going to happen? Am I going to choke? Am I going to... And I, I found myself starting literally to, to panic. What, what sounds to me like what others describe as a panic attack. I found myself thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to rear up out of this chair, rip everything out of my mouth, swallow and reassert control because there's nothing worse in the world than being completely out of control in a distressing situation. But I knew that if I did that, it would do me no good because we just have to start the procedure all over again. And so I pray. And what is my prayer? God, get me out of this. Instinctively, get me out of this. Just make it be over, God. I'm saying silent to myself. Just let it be over. Let it hurry up and be over. As if God was going to suddenly move time forward. And this was going to say, wow, I don't know what just happened. It's a miracle. You're done. <laughs> but it was just getting worse and worse. And then it finally hit me. Maybe I'm asking for the wrong thing. Maybe instead of asking God to miraculously deliver me out of this situation and let it be over, maybe instead I should pray, God, show me the way through this. Show me how I can get through this. And when I started praying that the first time, three times ago, when I started praying that, I sensed God saying to me, calm down. Nobody's ever died while getting a filling before. 
You'll make it through this. Stop thinking about it. You'll get through it. And a peace came over me. It wasn't comfortable, but a peace came over me. And guess what? I got through it. I ended up doing what in the midst of my panic I thought I couldn't do. And in the process, I discovered that I'm stronger and wiser. I learned something from that. Our problem with prayer is that we spend most of our time in prayer telling God what to do. Get me out of here. Instead of asking God, show me the way through this. We are like those Navy SEALs in training. If a Navy SEAL is exempted from all of the hardships that are embedded in the training, what happens? That na There's a deliberate reason why those exercises are required. It's not sadism. The Navy has learned over time that if you want strong, pow the best, pow most powerful soldiers, you got to put them through hell week. Because in that process, if they don't quit, they're going to discover, I could do what I thought I couldn't do. And they're going to gain wisdom, and they're going to become the best that they can be. We are all, in a sense, Navy SEALs in training for the rest of this life and for all of eternity. Yes, there are surely times when God wants to miraculously deliver us out of a situation, but most of the time, God's objective is to instead miraculously deliver us through a situation. But we miss that because we get so busy telling God what to do as if we know better than God. So we spend all of our time telling God what we want, and much of what we tell God we want is misdirected because there's so much in life that we don't understand. What would happen if instead of spending all of our time telling God what to do, we were to cut that kind of prayer in half and use the other half of our prayer to pray the way Daniel did in today's story? In today's story, note how Daniel prayed and how he asked his three friends to pray. It wasn't Daniel saying, God, get me out of here. It wasn't an escapist prayer. It wasn't God caused the king to miraculously change his mind and revoke his decree. It wasn't God, show me a secret way to escape Babylon. No, Daniel simply asked God a question. Will you please reveal the king's dream to me and what it means? Daniel simply asked a question, and then Daniel listened and waited for the answer. We don't know how long he had to wait. We just know that eventually the answer came to him because Daniel knew, Daniel understood that there is a God in heaven who reveals the hidden things. God knows what is in the darkness. Daniel knew and believed that God reveals the deep and hidden things. God knows what's in the darkness. So Daniel asked, and he waited. He sat with it. He let it breathe. He tuned in, like Robert was saying in the children's sermon. He raised his antenna, and he listened, and he waited, and he got the answer. He got the direction that allowed Daniel to get through it, allowed his three friends to get through it, and allowed all the wise men of Babylon to survive it because he was listening and paying attention. As James Kennedy says, what matters in life is, what, is not what happens to us. It's what happens in us. Once upon a time, there was a tiny frog who was lonely and longed for true love. The frog was so desperate for love that he eventually went to a psychic to see what his future held. The psychic looked into her crystal ball. She said, 
I'm starting to get something. I see something. What is it? What is it? The frog says. I see a beautiful woman, a beautiful young woman in your future. She will be fascinated by you. She will want to know everything about you. The little frog croaks with excitement. This is great. He says, where will I meet her? Will it be at a party? No, the psychic says. You will meet her in biology class. <laughs> the next time you're facing a tough decision and you really want to know what to do, don't go to a psychic. Don't dig your magic eight ball out of the boxes in the basement. Go to God. Ask your questions and listen. Robert McFarland, back in the 1970s, was a businessman in uh, Los Angeles. He started a, a brand new business that grew and thrived, became very successful. But over the course of time, problems, unresolved problems, began to build up in this business. And he got to the point where he feared that everything was going to fall apart, that the company was going to experience bankruptcy. In fact, the stress became so great that one day, sitting at his desk, McFarlane had a panic attack. He just got up, he walked out of the building, he got in his vehicle, and he says, I just started driving. I got on the highway in Los Angeles, and I headed west toward Arizona. I had no idea where I was going. I, I just knew that I had to get out of there, and I was going to go someplace far away where nobody could find me. It was complete escapism in his panic. But as he was driving along, he says, there came a point where something strange happened. I heard a voice, which was impossible, he says, because I was the only one in the car. But I heard a voice behind me that said, pull over. He said, I thought it was imaginary, so I disregarded it. But a little bit later, the same thing, pull over. So he says, I pulled over, turned off the engine. And he said, I just began to sob uncontrollably. For the next hour, I just cried and vented my angst, my fear, my, my worries, my frustration. And he says, when I was finally all cried out, as I sat there in silence, it finally occurred to me to say, God, what should I do? Guide me. What should I do? McFarland says, as I sat there waiting, all of a sudden, I started getting these insights, these thoughts, these ideas about ways to resolve these problems. I started scribbling them down. When I was done, he said, I started the engine back up. I went to the next exit, turned around, headed back, walked into my building, sat down at my desk that afternoon. He said, I made 10 key decisions that we implemented Within 30 days, things were starting to turn around. Within a year, he says, the business was thriving again because I finally stopped telling God what to do. Save my business. Solve this problem for... And started asking God questions and listening. What would happen if we decided that we're going to take at least half of our time in prayer to simply ask God questions and listen for answers. Yes, there is a time and a place for telling God what we want and hope for, but keep that in its place and allow ample time to ask God questions and to listen. It's what's called dialogue prayer. This is what a dialogue prayer looks like. First, don't sit there in silence with your thoughts or your thoughts will go a million different directions. In a dialogue prayer, talk to God. So speak aloud or write out or type out your words so that your brain is engaging the words. Describe the situation to God, not because God doesn't know the situation, but for your own sake and the sake of your subconscious, lay it all out there on the table so it's right there fresh in your consciousness. Then ask God questions and listen and sense what God might be trying to say to you. And when you start to get something, when you start to sense something, ponder that. Think about it. Write down what you think you're sensing. 
or speak it aloud and ponder it. Does this feel to me like what God is saying to me? Does God's spirit bear witness with my spirit that this is God's answer to my questions? And if so, go with it. Even as you go, though, keep your antenna up. Keep tuned in. Stay in that listening mode. Listen to what the people say around you. God might be speaking through them. Look at your circumstances. Watch for signs. Notice your dreams. Live as if you're expecting that God will actually speak to you. And in the process, you'll discover that you're developing a deep, interactive relationship with God as an added bonus. But here's the catch. Living that way is hard. It takes a lot of faith. And that brings us to the final point in today's sermon. In times of distress, what should we do? According to Daniel 2, first, never give up hope. Number two, engage God in dialogue prayer. Instead of telling God what to do, ask God what to do. Number three, though, to live that way, to do that consistently, you've got to dare to believe that God will actually speak to you. I mean, we Christians talk a good game, but most of the time we live more like naturalists, like we believe it's all up to us. It takes a lot of faith to believe that God cares enough about me to speak to me if I will listen. Do you believe? Let me close with this. Uh, years ago, Brent Walsh, some of you know Brent. He was part of our congregation and then moved to the East Coast. But Brent Walsh told me a story about when he was uh, growing up, his family when he was growing up. There was a time when they were, his family was moving from Florida to Illinois. His dad had gone on ahead of them to start his new job. And now his mom, two sisters, and he, Brent, were loading into a car in Florida and about to make the trek up to Illinois in, in two segments. Their goal that first day was to get from Florida to central Tennessee where Brent's mom, Jan, where her sister lived. They were going to stay there a couple weeks, visit with them, and then make, make it the rest of the way to Illinois. So that first day's drive was really, really long. Nighttime fell. It became late. Brent says we were somewhere in the middle of Georgia when we entered into a construction zone. It was then that Jan noticed that they were beginning to run low on gas. So she thinks, okay, at the next exit, I'm going to stop and get some gas. But this construction zone seemed to extend forever. When she got to the next exit, that exit was closed. Got the next exit, it, it was closed. Another 12 miles pass, and she's still not found an exit that is open that has a gas station. She's starting to panic. She's starting to think, what's going to happen if I run out of gas out here in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night with my three kids? About that time, her little daughter said, Mommy, I've got a potty. Okay, she said, at the, at the next exit, when we get gas, hold on. So Jan says, I began to pray. She prayed, God, guide me. Show me what to do. Not long after that, there was a sign promising a gas station at the next exit. And lo and behold, the exit was open. But when they got to the top of the exit, Jan looked at the gas station and all the lights were out. It was now 2 a.m. in the morning. It was closed. Honey, I'm sorry, but you can't go potty here. Mommy, I can't hold it anymore. So Jan says, I pulled into the gas station thinking at least she can pee behind a tree. But when she got out of the vehicle, she noticed that behind the plate glass windows in the gas station, there was a woman standing at the counter doing some paperwork. So Jan knocked on the plate glass window and mouthed the words, can we come in? The woman waved her and the kids in. Jan explained that they really needed to use the restroom and get some gas, and the woman said that was fine. And, the woman, and Jan said to the woman, I'm surprised you're still open. The woman said, oh, we were supposed to close at midnight. But she said, my son is in a lot of trouble, and I can't sleep, so I thought I may as well get some work done. Jan said, you know, I'm going to pray for your son. After a bit, the kids have all gone to the bathroom. The car's gassed up. Jan gathers up a few snacks, puts them on the counter, pulls money out of her purse, about to pay for the snacks and the gas, as she hands the money to the woman. The woman says, no, 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 you keep your money. 
Jan was insistent. No, no, she says, I've got enough. The woman cut her off midstream, gave her this intense look and said, no, keep your money. You're going to need it to get where you're going. It was kind of spooky. Jan thought, who is this woman and how does she know what I'm going to need? But she thanked her. She asked her to write down her address on an envelope so that she could send her a thank you note. So they get back on the road, full tank of gas. Hours down the road, Jan begins to realize that she's miscalculated and that to get to her sister's house, she's going to actually have to top off the tank. She pulls into the next gas station, tops off the tank, and discovers that the exact amount that she owes is the exact amount of money that she had left that she had tried to give to the former cashier, but the former cashier refused. So that if she had given that money to the former cashier, she wouldn't have been able to pay for this gas, and they would have gotten stranded. The next day at her sister's house, Jan wrote a thank you note and sent it to the woman who'd been so kind. Two weeks later, it comes back marked, no one by that name at this address. Jan thought, maybe I transposed a letter or something. She looked at the address, no, it was right. And she found herself wondering, what's going on here? <laughs> Who was that woman? Is it possible she was? Bryn says, as me and my sister were growing up, my mom kept repeating that story to us many different times to remind us that we serve a God who cares enough about us to speak wisdom into our lives and to guide us if only we will ask and listen. Do you believe? Let's live our faith. God cares about you and wants to provide, speak guidance into your life and guide you through life's most treacherous situations. Ask and then listen and you will receive guidance. Let's live our faith. Amen.